All right. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's another episode of the Balance Blues Brothers podcast. Today, uh, I'm very happy to be joined by Stu Flatterty. Um, he's uh, got an ex extensive resume. Uh, he's coached 16 years in college, two years in NISA Pro, has won there with the Michigan Stars, has won two independent cups, formerly an analyst with, or currently analyst with uh, Indy 11, um, which is my hometown local team. And we will uh, see what other adventures he has in, planned in this rest of his coaching career. But happy to welcome on extensive knowledge here and experience in the game. And more so, he is also a Middlesbrough fan so and supporter. So we're looking forward to getting both kind of aspects and perspectives from the Chelsea side and from the Borough side. Uh, from the 1-0 Borough win in the semifinal of the uh, Carabao Cup yesterday. And... You know, Stu, I'll let you get right into it. In the first half, uh, what were some of your thoughts? Because a lot of what I saw was a lot of huffing and puffing from Chelsea and a very resolute Borough team that was willing to take their chances and they got them. Well, yeah, I mean, it was it was two very different halves. Um, but I think to understand the story of Carrick at Middlesbrough is important because in isolation, this is getting written off, right? I've read it all on Twitter. He just sat behind the ball. He just did this. That's not impressive, blah, blah, blah. And uh, it was impressive, actually. And anyone on Twitter with a Twitter account could go into that Middlesbrough locker room and say, right, guys, just sit in. Sit in and we'll just get our win. And it's, it's not how life works. You know, more like 99% of coaches are getting beat heavily, I think, with those two lineups out. Um, and Carrick lost in the semifinals of the playoffs last year. And it's really tough to argue that he doesn't have a worse team now, even at full strength. You know, Tuber Akpom goes to Ajax. Ryan Giles goes to Luton, Premier League. Cameron Archer, uh, Sheffield United, Premier League. Aaron Ramsey, Barnsley, Premier League. Zach Steffen, Man City loan back. So he's lost half of the um, half of the starting lineup from last year, and he didn't win any of the first five games. So there was a downgrade. And on top of that, he enters this game with 12 injuries and significant ones, you know, a starting goalkeeper down, um, centre-back down. Paddy McNair, who can play centre-back or right-back down. Um, Daryl Lenahan's the captain. He's down. Mason Rogers is, I think, Borough's leading scorer in this tournament. He's down. Uh, Lati Lath lasts five minutes <laughs> at centre forward. So yeah. he's effectively down. I, I, I would argue recently, Bangura, the left back, might have been Middlesbrough's best player. Probably at the, at the levels of Giles last year. He's down 20 minutes in. I mean, uh, Riley McGree is, I believe, the most entertaining midfielder in the Middlesbrough team and the most creative. He's out. I mean, it's it's not just the, it's catchy to say, I saw a tweet saying 12 starters injured. Well, nobody starts 12 players, so that's nonsense. But there's some seriously big time guys here who are out of the team. He has uh, lost to Rotherham, lost heavily to Coventry on New Year's Day. And then he's got back to back, back to back games against Villa and Chelsea. That's mentally and emotionally hard to manage. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, I'm not going to say this to trigger the fan base because I, I like you and I, I, I've got a soft spot for Chelsea. I've had some friends play for Chelsea, but uh, Villa were much better than Chelsea. You know, I'll talk about it during this, but to see those two Premier League teams back to back against Middlesbrough and Middlesbrough be the underdog in both, um, Villa Villa was significantly better, to be honest with you. Um, but this is a Middlesbrough team that's been good in cups. When you look at the the uh, Fry, McNair, Coburn, Housen, these guys have won at Old Trafford on penalties. These guys beat Tottenham in 22 before getting beat by Chelsea, actually, with a, a Chelsea team I found significantly more impressive than this one. Um, they've lost on an 88th-minute free kick to Villa last week. This is a team that finds a way to have a backbone in these types of games. So I don't think they sat back at all. And I think if Chelsea had scouted Middlesbrough, you look at the wing-back, Isaiah Jones, that's a weakness. You know, Asaya Jones is a good player, a very good player, but he's primarily a good attacking player. And Raheem Sterling v. Jones, the fact that Chelsea can't expose that, and A, Jones is not, you know, not made, Middlesbrough not paid to have Jones defending that flank in any way, and Jones sets up the winner, that's, on some level that's not acceptable, right? And Mason Rogers is out, and Riley McGree's out, but weirdly, that might have worked in Middlesbrough's favour because the midfield three they did um, they did start of Johnny House and Dan Barlasser and Hayden Hackney, which turned into Matt Crooks after a change in shape. These are tough guys. These are hard guys. And 
the pattern of the first half to me was Conor Gallagher making a little touch to get out of space and then Crooks smashing him and taking the ball off him. Cole Palmer, who's the centre forward, yep. getting so frustrated he came into play centre mid, skips past someone, Hackney dispossesses him. Middlesbrough were uh, Middlesbrough were a bear in that midfield third and it wasn't sitting back, it was pressure. And it was, you know, yes, we're going to wait for you to enter our half to press you, but when you get there, we're coming. You know, Conor Gallagher didn't have no time. Enzo Fernandez didn't have no time. Cole Palmer didn't have no time when he dressed it in the middle third. And that's that's an aggressive style of play to do that. That's very different to just sitting back and gritting your teeth. And if you look at the first minute, it's to me, it's a shame because Middlesbrough were going to counter, right? And Latte Lat, he's fast, he's strong, he's athletic. You don't know if you only saw him that game because he played for like five minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, I know he was out almost as soon as Yeah, started. he's athletically so many levels above Josh Coburn. That was a a bad sub to have to make. Now, Coburn's got his strengths, but it's not to play against a team where you're going to try and sit in and hit on the break. He's not fast. Um, he's not great at holding possession. Josh Coburn's going to thrive if Middlesbrough's on the front foot and hammering crosses into the box. And that's just not what the game is. But um, Levi Colwell, who I like, mm -hmm. disappointing. Very yes, disappointing. Yes, they targeted him the whole first half. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first, the, the first minute which again goes against the narrative of Middlesbrough setting in. The first minute, he's under pressure from Jones. Yep. He messes up the back pass. And, you know, the, the commentators said it was a penalty, right? I don't think it was a penalty. What do you think? I've never seen a penalty after the shot's gone. No, no, I haven't seen that. <laughs> I didn't see a penalty there either in the first yeah, half. Yeah, both ESPN commentators were saying penalty if it was VAR. And I, I didn't, didn't see it at all, to be honest with you. But if you look at... Um, the ways Middlesbrough attacked, and this isn't going to be great production, but I'm going to share my screen to just show you some observations I had on the game. Now, sure. if people are wondering why it's screenshots, that's not to be manipulative and not show highlights. It's a, a copyright issue, and Thanks. we are not getting away with uh, sharing our screen. Oh, no, is it not? Let me just yeah. get... share screen. We'll do our best for the listeners to try to convey that. But I think just kind of, you know, what you're saying early on, it, when I was watching the first half too early on, I agree with you. I don't think the Middlesbrough were just sitting back deep. You know, they were they were getting several different chances. It wasn't just Chelsea just again and again and again and again. You know, they actually went at it and tried to – I thought at least they were being more strategic when they chose to take their chances, and it did work pretty well. Yeah, and if you look at this – this is after the ball over the top. There, there's five Middlesbrough players there joining that attack. That's not, you know, Jones and Laff going forward. All three of the Middlesbrough midfield three are advanced there. So yep. was it the whole game? No. But when Middlesbrough had the ball and when Middlesbrough went in behind, they were not attacking in bunches of two or three like some teams do. They were very much going with five. Now, this was yeah, five, primary three, two. shape of the half, right? And yep. people are going to say, oh... That's sitting in. Well, here's what I'm going to argue. No, it isn't. That is a bunch of players in red shirts doing their job. The midfield, the back three here are marking up. The wing backs, it's Chelsea ball. You have to respect the shape. We've got, what's this guy's name, 11? I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Uh, Nani Madueke. So Madueke, he's forward. So Bangura has to come back. And I know fans will say, you've got to be aggressive. Bangura's got to get up and press. Well, why would you do that? It would leave too much insane. isolation you know, on that, that wing. That would be done to make a TV spectacle, have a 4-3 game, and appease neutral fans as opposed to compete. Bangura has to do his job here, and these guys have to, if you see, they're not just standing in random spots, they're cutting off the passing lane here. So Chelsea yep. can't feed the feet of Gallagher. They can't feed the feet of Palmer. This is strategic now. And those guys would have to drop deeper into in between those two lines to receive, or somebody else got to pull out a position to move up to help the build up in that case. Exactly. Now uh, they've got uh, nothing on here, and this system is such where the only pressureless pockets, because unless you're playing ten v ten all over the field, nobody does. Yeah. You you have pressure. It's the fullback here, and it's the fullback here. And again, what threat is that? If we're cutting off the ball to the centre forward and we're getting a number up here, see this square of players here, this yep, is nothing your... to worry about. So Chelsea's path to victory here is Madueke and Sterling 1v1 putting a clinic on, which I would argue against Asaya Jones and Bangura. Maybe it should have happened, man. 
But out, out of interest, I took some stats on Sterling, and it's not impressive. He goes against Jones early, and then when Middlesbrough switch shape, he goes against Van den Bog 1v1. We get one dangerous cross out of it. One block cross, one pressured cross, four times he passes the ball off, one cross straight to an uncovered centre-back, one way, wayward cross that might or might not have ended up in the River Tees, and once he was tackled. That's one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, ten isolations of your winger 1v1 against a fullback, and I would argue a player profile, a weak defensive fullback, and Sterling's done nothing. So the whole Middlesbrough sat in thing, that's not good enough. You know, and if, exactly. if that's seeping into the Chelsea personnel and staff, maybe that's a reason that these results aren't what they should be. No, I and I think that you hit upon one thing right there, talking about Sterling that I was going to talk about, that it seemed in the first half that the best way for Chelsea to try to create chances was through isolation on the wings, try to win 1v1s. Matuweki had a couple of those opportunities. He got one shot off in that first half. But other than that, there really wasn't a whole lot. And I think you make a good point there about Sterling in those 1v1s with so many dispossessions and loss and you know basically lost buildup plays in the final third in some of those cases. What I think that you make a good point there about is this is Raheem Sterling. This is a guy who's won every trophy he can compete for. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the most accomplished English players that I can imagine that I can name right now. And and he's not and he's being I don't want to say outclassed, but for lack of a better word, he is being outclassed by players that have, you know, objectively not achieved what he's achieved in the game. And I, and I agree with you. I don't think it was good enough. I was very, very frustrated yesterday with the game because I just felt the whole time, look, like we're just, we're repeating the same things over and over again. We're not adapting. And it's like, we just kept trying to play plan a um, and not really adapting throughout much of that. And yeah. I think you're right. And I saw this first, same thing in the first half. You know, although Middlesbrough, Middlesbrough are going to be sitting, sitting, and I hate to use that term, but they're going to be more defensive, right? They're going yeah. to be a little bit more defensive priorities. And they played these really nice compact zones right there in that back five throughout. And that made life very difficult because when we, when Chelsea did advance the ball closer to the uh, opponent's goal, there's simply hardly anywhere to go because of how well Burrow coped with us in terms of their defensive structure and covering the zones. And one thing, and we'll get to in the second half, but I also saw in the second half, there was almost a little bit more fluidity with how they were using their zonal uh, marking and their zonal coverage. And, and really it just resulted in a lot of U-shaped passing for Chelsea and really not much, not much threat at all. And, and that's been emblematic of the entire season for Chelsea. It's been a very bad season. And I think a lot of what we saw out of this team was just more of the same yesterday. And, I mean, Burrow had probably watched these uh, and kind of what you're highlighting and how they play, right? Where they have this, you know, they kind of have this 5-3-2 uh, shape. They're being very compact. They're keeping with the two midfielders and the two forwards. They're keeping this box in the midfield, try to win that numerical superiority and disrupt the buildup play and really create it where there's a forward line and a defensive line, a lack of a midfield, really, from this, from this graphic that we're looking at right now. But yeah. I think that one thing that they had to have known going into this game is, this Chelsea team struggle to break down low blocks that want to just that will they will say okay we can soak your pressure up and we'll spring on the counter and take our chances when we get them because we know that you're gonna that you're going to press higher up and I and and getting to how Burrow scored their goal you know we were higher up the field Burrow get the ball they send it over the top and because of how we're playing right now with Pochettino we we for the most part, always kind of move our, our center backs pretty high forward in the line, leaving a lot of space in behind. And that's a lot of teams do that anyway. But Burrow knew that and they saw it and they picked on Levi Colwell all in that first half. And well, it here's, worked. Here's why you struggle, though, Trav. If you look at this diagram, if Kai Sado moves from here to here, we would be having a build-up. If they're dropping or he's coming high, that, that's tough to deal with. If, yes. You know, your number 11 here comes in here, that's tough to deal with. This yep. is predict. This is four guys marking themselves. This is nobody building between the levels, and yep. this this is not good play. Now, if you look here, you know Middlesbrough aren't more attacking right now. Enzo's here, so yeah. centre mids out here. Middlesbrough don't have a front three now. This is why people can't get obsessed with system. Middlesbrough are marking players. Those yeah. the movement of those Chelsea players. It is the responsibility of Chelsea to confuse those guys. Middlesbrough really didn't have a hard time moving around in morphing shape to make sure with that 3v in the thriddle, 3v3 in the middle, there was no overload. And we'll talk about the halftime adjustments, and there was some. But And here, Johnny Housen's not a centre-back now. This is his guy. 
So yep. I think fans are very simplistic, and it, it happens to players too. You look at this clip, and, oh, well, Middlesbrough played a back six. Well, did they, or did they play a front three, or did it? Did the Middlesbrough players move around with the guy they were marking? The very foundation of the sport. But you have kids now, and I, I have cut and benched college and pro kids over this. I'm not going back there. I'm a 10. Well, guess what? If their six is up there, you absolutely are. Yeah, you have to. In. I'm a wing back. I'm a full back. If it's their ball and your guy's there, yes, you are. You know, they, these aren't tactical decisions by Michael Carrick. This is a physical reality. If it's Chelsea ball, Housen's guy's there, Housen goes there. The sport's actually not as complex as people like to think. Now, well, why were Middlesbrough on the back foot all the tanks? Chelsea had more of the ball. So you spend more time on the back foot, but like, were, were Chelsea dominant? No, if you look here, Middlesbrough got a four-man line now pretty high up the field. Yep. It's not a different system. The two Chelsea yep. guys have come deep because they're having no joy higher up the field. So the Middlesbrough guys can go higher. Asaya Jones has decided to press his guy for whatever trigger it was. It might have been a bad touch. It might have been a guy they isolated. But it, like this isn't a yep. team sitting in. That's a pretty high four-man line. Yeah, and that is a high four-man line. Number. And Chelsea continually struggled to deal with those things throughout the – I really saw a lot of lack of build-up play – that they really struggled a lot of those times. And you're right. You, I like that you've highlighted Caicedo because I do have a lot of things to say about him. And, you know, we talked about him and this kind of what he could have been doing, moving in between these two lines, right? Right now where he is, he's a, I mean, he's basically a nothing option right there. The, yeah. the two guys, the two guys in this, in this line of three have either a, a passing option that he could make where he moves pretty much locked off. So he's going to have to move in. Everybody else has to shift. And you made a good point earlier with that still, the, our forward line basically being in a straight line of four. I mean, this goes – that that's like high school level stuff. Don't be in a straight line and run in straight lines. It, it doesn't it doesn't confuse a defense. Now, what I was expecting, and you saw a bit of this out of Villa and you see it a lot out of Liverpool, when you see that flat four high to pin Middlesbrough, I was expecting a Chelsea centre-back higher in the build, a Chelsea full-back up to impact the game, leave a footprint on the game. But yep. uh, not really, man. Not really. No. No, and, and I think that part of that is I know we have a lot of guys that are hurt. I mean, and that's been a that's been a theme this entire season, just as it has for Burrow. So it's not an excuse for Chelsea. Like I don't know how you feel about it, but I kind of get annoyed a lot when I just hear people, oh, well, we can't get results. We have injuries. You know, it's just I, I think I that's very that. frustrating. Everybody so you know, has injuries. It's professional sport. You know Chelsea more than me. And then also you gotta be careful, right? Because there's you can't say something on Twitter and now that's what the fans and the players think. But the fans listen to media. The fans listen to Twitter. And yep. going back to Lampard, I think Chelsea left themselves vulnerable to a lack of backbone. Because, you know, whether you're Middlesbrough or whether you're Chelsea or Burnley or Brentford, you are dealing with very competitive creatures who've got right to the top of professional sports based on yes. fighting and winning. A huge part of their self-identity is put me in a fight and watch me win it. Now, if you over time coach those guys through a vision of, yeah, I know we're not really winning right now, but this is what it's going to look like in the future. But they've already won. Like, Silver's already won the Champions League. You know, that doesn't really work, man. That doesn't really work. And then for the guys in the middle of the pack who maybe aren't the greatest competitors and they need an excuse, well, they've got one now. They don't have to win today. There's no pressure to win today. I'll tell you a big reason might Middlesbrough White might win this second leg. Does it even matter to Chelsea? Don't know. You know, does, does an EFL Cup final matter to this club, matter to this team, or is it irrelevant anywhere? And if, well, if my suspicion is right, they will lose the second leg too. And it won't matter because it won't be we lost, we failed. It will be, ah, they sat in, things happen, blah, blah, blah. Look how good we're being in two years. Yes. I don't know if that's where Chelsea have gone because there was a, um, I'm not going to jump ahead, but there was a lack of, dominance on the game but I, don't, I want to stay in order so we'll go back to that later but if you look here again footprint of the first half where are Chelsea going here yeah, there's nowhere to go Every, nowhere nobody's to go. being an option there's the only options here just to pass back and forth between the two center backs Sterling here is in space so if you can find Sterling or you can get your full back up and double up Jones with Sterling fair enough that's your ticket to victory in this game again was it done not really you know not really no. and no, now it's this is when I really started to think Middlesbrough might do this because I am well aware of the difference between Middlesbrough and Chelsea. I've got eyes, but that's your centre forward on the ball right there. That is Cole Palmer on the ball. And that's, there's yeah, only that's... one reason 
he's going there to get the ball because he's not touching it up in dangerous areas. So now he's coming in here. Now, theoretically, that turns a 3v3 into a 4v3, but there is still no room. And now no. that's Enzo. So now you're telling me we're going to sacrifice Palmer in the build so we can get the ball to Enzo v. Dale Fry. Not concerned, man. That's not well, dangerous. That's it's not. not it because especially because it doesn't. I mean, it's just in general, that is not how we maximize Enzo or Paul, right? Yep. That, that's best. And I would argue after watching these guys a lot, having Palmer drop that deep and Enzo moving forward to cover is basically minimizing their talents. Yeah, in a lot of ways, in terms of how we use them in, in our in our in, in our attack. But I de I definitely see here. This is a huge problem. And, and again, like Caicedo is nowhere to be an option. It, it, Enzo is way up there. We can't we can't get the isolation of Sterling out on the wing. And even if we did get it to Sterling on the wing, he's going to be numeric. It's either going to be an even numbers game there, or it's going to be outnumbered there. Unless that out unless that outside center back pushes forward to help create that you know numerical advantage. But we just yeah. didn't do that in the first half. It, it didn't happen. It, and that space is there to move into. But it just wasn't being done. Here's why I'm concerned if I'm a Chelsea fan here, right? You're going to sacrifice your centre forward to go into centre mid. You're still not numbers up in centre mid. That's a no. huge concern, man. If you drew like a line, the width of the six, look at that. Like Middlesbrough win that like 99 times out of 99, not even 100. So yeah. when, when you see that, again, there's a you're begging for a 2v1 here. Yep. But we can't find it. And, and and that's the yeah, thing is why why people. can we not find Sterling? He's the most accomplished player on that field. Well, yeah, I agree. But you did find him ten times one v one. He didn't do his part, in my opinion. True, true. In that example, that's I, I yeah. In that example, it's more of why can't we get it there? But you're right. When we did get it to him, it wasn't. He just simply was not effective. I think I think Matuweki had a couple opportunities to be effective and did okay. But again, this is a 21, 22 year old player. This is one of the biggest games he's probably played at is at a club level in terms of a cup competition right yeah. now. Uh, he previously, he was at PSV. He probably did better than Sterling. Probably so. He probably he probably did, and I would agree. I think what I saw in that first half in those sixty minutes that he played, I thought he did more than Sterling. Um, unfortunately, and this is the other, and this gets to this is what I wanted to get to is your kind of your point about we kind of lack that backbone, that spine of the team. Well, we sold all of that spine. We sold all those accomplished players. We got rid of them all all in the same summer, and this is kind of the result now. The only player out there that has a really accomplished career and a lot of references in the game, a lot to fall back on, is Sterling. Everybody else is a young player still kind of figuring out and getting their feet. And when he, being you know that senior, you know, experienced leadership-type profile on the team, when he's not delivering and he's not helping instruct or do other things to move around, I mean, those other young guys are just are. I mean, they look just as lost, and and it's this has been a continual theme all season. Where where outside of Silva and, and Sterling, where does where does our leadership come from? Where does the spine of this team come from? Where does the experience, the references to help these young players, where is it coming from? And it's just not happening. It, it's just sadly, it's not. And I and I agree with you as a Chelsea fan. I am concerned. I do see a lot of these problems week in yeah. and week out. It's the same general things. Our buildup is slow. It's it's turgid. It's it's just very labored a lot of times. And and all, and what I get annoyed at a lot with possession and this idea that we have to have the ball. Too many times we just keep the ball for the sake of keeping the ball, and we don't have any killer intent when we have that. And we move in the final third. It's just slow. It's there's no urgency in my opinion uh, in this Chelsea side. And I think that outside of a couple opportunities in that first half and really the best opportunities that Chelsea had were from, you know, interceptions and pressing and, and misplaced passes from, from Burrow. Yeah. We didn't do a whole lot of our own creation is what I'm kind of getting at. And for the reasons you're mentioning right here, like, I mean, there's so many midfield overloads that Burrow are easily winning. I mean, look right here. What is this? A six, a two, five V two. Yeah. Well, one thing I was, I couldn't find my screenshot here, which is a shame. But the one bit that Chelsea, Joy Chelsea did have is they had a couple of players where Maduike checked. And I think it was Gusto on that side went high. Yes. And yep. Bangura was kind of caught between. So on the 20 minute mark, Bangura got injured, which is a bad injury for Middlesbrough. And it was kind of a change in shape. 
because uh, this is now Matt Clark, who subbed in as a centre-back, and Engel moved over to left-back in a back four. And as you can see, Hayden Hackney came out to centre-mid to right wing. I believe because Gusto and Madawik here were presenting a threat. Now it's a back four, so now Sterling's not against Jones anymore. He's against uh, Rav Vandenberg. But still, even in the 4-3-3, you can see that there's nowhere to go central. But like a player of Sterling's level, the reason you pay 30, 40 million for these guys is when you get this, and that's 2v1 effectively, they'll win yep. your games from those positions. And what Pochettino's probably going to tell you behind closed doors is, if I set a game plan out and I get my winger isolated 10 times against Desire Jones and Rav Vandenberg, I expect to win that game. And you know what? Probably a decent point. Now, if you look here, yeah. this was interesting again, and it, it's begging Gusto to do something, and he didn't. This is the right winger, Hackney. But all Hackney's worried about is you can't find Cole Palmer behind me. He's giving you this, letting you have it. Send it mm -hmm. to your fullback, go forward, double up the substitute left back, who's just got on the field, by the way, and do something about it. But they, they don't, again, you know, there's, there's such a low energy Low yes. intensity team compared to Villa, compared to Liverpool, compared to these top teams that they used to be. And here is a real example of it. This is um, a Cole Palmer attack and Middlesbrough's trapped in, right? Now you get this scenario against Liverpool. Liverpool win this ball back eight, nine times out of ten. You know, when I coached college and pro, we would track streak shooting. And what streak shooting is, how many shots can you get off before the opponent gets over the halfway line? Every single time that I can remember that number goes higher than five in a game, we win that game. Far more reflective than XG because physically you've penned the game in and mentally, emotionally, it's crippling. You just can't get out. They come, you try and get out, you can't get out. They come again, they come again, they come again. And you yep. just start to feel the walls close in. We've all seen... If we've you've you felt we've it, been there as a player. Yeah, you, you know, know how it is. Seen it, it's the worst feeling. And this here, if Chelsea... Get in these positions after an attack and rob Middlesbrough five or six times in the half. I guarantee you that crowd's not as excited and Middlesbrough don't have their belief I do. But two passes later, Trav, it looks like this. Two passes. They, oh they pass seven yards to the winger. The winger passes it back. And now right in the heart of the field where you should have Look. your centre-backs here and three midfielders here, you've got Barlasser on the ball. He's got a protective circle of about 10, 15 yards. He's facing forwards, Middlesbrough counter. Let's find and, and this fast. The important thing there, too, is Caicedo has a decision. If he pre if he steps forward on the ball, seven right there, the goal, whoever, who eventually scores the goal, right? I mean, he's just going to go right past him. And it's just going to be an easy pass, too. I mean, yeah. they're basically okay. giving Caicedo a decision. Do I stay with the runner? Do I take the ball? Do I stay in my zone? And if he's isolated. And, and this is – dude, this is a great still because – there's a lot of times this season with Caicedo and in, in the way that we're using him, he just sits isolated alone in midfield. And it's, it's, I, I would ask, I would ask if you should blame him because if you watch Liverpool do this and watch him, you got two center backs on this halfway line, like guard dogs, and one will come off here and they'll have a fullback and a center back guarding the counter. If you remember before Allison and before Van Dyke, everyone said Klopp's system couldn't work because it was too vulnerable yep. to counter. And then, yep. In your face, in your face, in your face. It's so easy to get out against Chelsea that I don't care how much of the ball you have and I don't care how good you are. And the best player on the field is still probably Cole Palmer. If you're in a position where 10, 15 times Middlesbrough can get out and Cole Will can't mark Jones, it's always yeah. going to be a game. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be if you're Pochettino. Like, you should have higher standards than that. And... Again, and it, what you're describing is nothing that's new. This has been all. This has been a pattern all season for this team. Uh, yeah, exactly what you're describing. Um, it's been a pattern all season, and eventually, I mean, we eventually, you know, Burrow take their chances and get the get the goal in the first half. And when I, when I saw, you know, when I saw that we're down one nil, I, I I really thought this. Uh, I I I'm never going to say I don't have hope as a fan because we always have hope as a fan, but. I knew things were dire. I knew things were dire in this match on the road against a really resolute team that seems to really know what they're doing in this game. And, you know, I, I Chelsea just are one of those teams that continually feel like 
they just bluster and bluster and they uh, offensively and they never produce anything. And then defensively, it's just so fragile. I mean, it just seems like if you put a, a like in this match, you put the ball over Levi Cole's head. They did it again and again and again. And he, he struggles again and again to cope with it. It's a, it's a problem at the end of the day. I well, mean, here's, here's why you struggle law because you've got a nice little attacking formation here, right? All the course and coaching licenses would love that formation. You don't get the no one gets to say you part the bus. Look how high your wingers are. Look at yeah. like your center forward pushed high in the line, marked by three guys, by the way. But it's like it's attacking, it's all this. It's Trav, it's two v five. Yeah, it is. Nothing's happening, brother. I don't care if that's Middlesbrough, Darlington, Barnett. Like <laughs> nothing's happening two v five. You're not that no, good. No. And there's just there's just no space, there's nowhere to go. I mean, it, it, anyway, I mean that type of overload. If we can't, if we can't cope, there's nothing to do. And you're right. Whenever they're whenever they're congesting the midfield, why aren't we finding these isolated wide positions? Yeah, we're and, and we just didn't do it. We didn't do it. I don't know if that's tactical from Pochettino, but I I would struggle to think that you know a manager of his caliber is not going to be able to see something that a lot of people can see. Just you know, I mean, he has so much more experience than anybody. Um, it I, I would I would struggle to find how he's not pointing this out to the team whether in match or halftime or in training, whatever it may be. I think he obviously did it at halftime. And by the way, my stills out are order here, but no one can fire me because we're not getting paid for this. But if you see here, this was the before the Bangura shape change. You see how they've isolated him 2v1 here, and he's yep. kind of unsure. And then the other time Middlesbrough really struggled is when they isolated Bangura again and Cole Palmer looped around. Yep. So they were having a little bit in that 3-5-2 of uh, – Bangura starting to struggle a little bit numerically, and I think that's why on the 20-minute sub, that's why uh, Carrick went to a back four, so he had Engel and Hackney on that side. Now, if you look here, again, park the bus. Half Middlesbrough's team is pushed up high. And do you yeah. know what this is? They're not scared no more. They don't believe that if they get right up in the face of Conor Gallagher, they get right up in the face of Caicedo, right up in their face. They don't believe Chelsea can do anything about it now, and that's well, and not a good sign. And they re- and th- and I think that's a that's an important point too, because I always I always you know even in your own coaching I'm sure you've had this when you're playing a team that you know is the underdog right you know they're the underdog. The yeah. longer that score sits nil nil, the more confidence they're going to gain. Yeah, that's and- what's coming in the second leg. Anxiety, frustration, and scoreboard pressure all wear Middlesbrough jerseys. Now, if Chelsea score twice early does the middle will come back? I don't think so. But nil-nil at half time, oh, that might get <laughs> real anxious inside that stadium. Yes. I, I mean, as a fan, I would be anxious too. Three halves and we can't break down one goal for against a borough team. Yeah. You're for gonna Robert, start to as a you're gonna Robert start to as a player thing. If not now, when? It's fair, it's fair. I wonder I think, if oh, chronic mindset issues. Now, this was really, I thought. Interesting for two reasons in the Borough goal, because if you're teaching a young forward to some real nice player by Josh Colburns, first of all, this is horrendous from Colwell. Colwell's yeah. in a position where this shouldn't be a threat, but A, he gets beat off this touch after the still you press player, and B, he gets megged with the yep. cross. Now, what yep. Colburn does well is nine times out of ten, this six foot, two, three, whatever he is, centre forward, crashes the post. Colburn knows that, and he comes out here and if you watch the replay, it should be easy to find for anyone interested. De Sassi literally freezes. Yes. He like goes with Corburn, realizes he shouldn't be going with Corburn. But there's two dudes here that could attract Hackney. Neither yep. does. And yep. if you watch before the goal, Caicedo's literally more worried about getting his hands behind his back to make sure he doesn't give a penalty away than marking Hackney. And it's a tap-in from an unmarked yeah. player who's marked by two guys here. But these two guys aren't engaged. Again, low-energy team, low-intensity team. Does this really matter to them? Honestly, I don't know. I think I think Stu, I, I gotta ask you a question on this. Is, is this Chelsea goal and their failure here? Is this just basically an inability to do the basics, like tracking runners? I think you know what? I would say 95% of the goals are related to some some aspect of the basics. Like, could she could should Kai Saido track hackney? Yes. Yeah. Is is, is De Sassi caught out by good movement from Corburn? Yes. Yep. Should Colwell block that cross? Yes. Middlesbrough figured out a way to stuff Sterling 10 times. That's not a threat. Yeah. That's not a threat. That if you, you press still there, that should not be a goal. The no. Sassy should delete Coburn 
Hackney should buy track by one of two guys, and the cross shouldn't really come in anyway. Now, Asaya Jones is a good player, I understand that, but like, we're 600 million deep buying this team. We can't find a winger to do this. It's Asaya yeah. Jones breaking the game open. It, it's borderline insane. It is. It is. And I, and I, in, I try to not just get in over my head and look at this stuff as, as this, you know, emotional fan and look at it for what it really is. And, and what you're saying, this is, this is the reality of the situation. right now. And, and this has been, it, it's not just this match. It's all of these matches. I mean, it's so much up and down with Chelsea where, very much a Jekyll and Hyde team. Sometimes they come out and they look pretty good. And then they look like this, right? Where, you know, Colwell's beat over the top. He doesn't recover. He makes a mistake. He gets nutmegged for the for the cross. DeSassi can't cover the runner. Caicedo, and I, I can't tell who that is. I think maybe Gusto can't cover another guy coming in. Those are just collective errors across the field that are adding up. And, you know, and I, I think that, Really, I know it is, some people might say it was against the run of play, this, that, and the other. But from what we're seeing here, it's not really against the run of the play. I mean, Burrow have pushed so far the, up. Against, they've been pushing this like whole when, first half. Yeah, when Middlesbrough went over the top in the first minute, and then again in the fifth minute. Yep. And then this comes from a throwing where Barlazza just chips it in behind. Is it is it a fluke or is it design? That's and that's that's what I thought when I was watching the first half was. As soon as they, like you said, at first minute they come out and play that ball, I was like, this team's not just going to, this team's not just here to take part. They're actually trying to go out and win this game. Yeah. They're not it's just actually, sitting, uh... they're not just sitting 11 men behind the ball. They're not just parking everybody in their own half and trying to just hoof it up the field and get lucky one time. They didn't do that. I mean, they just categorically did not do that. But I think that that is a, a default answer for a lot of fans is to think that, well, maybe in the second half, I can understand people that were saying that they were sitting a bit more. But in this first half, they were not sitting as much as it was, it's been made out to be. They actually had a plan. They're pushing their line forward. They have a, they're have always winning numerical superiorities in midfield. And it really and, – and our wingers couldn't win those 1v1s, as you highlighted. So you're right. Yeah, this I is, this is bigger than be, just one match. People have to be honest with themselves is somewhere deep in that last 15 minutes – and I'm looking for the timestamps here, but there is a uh, there is a predict you know there's a glimpse in the future of the second leg, a foreshadowing, if you will, because three times in 16 minutes, Middlesbrough get in on the counter, and it's it's pretty dangerous counters. You know, first Jones is in one v one, then Corburn links with Hackney, he's in and he gets shepherded out of play by uh, Silver, and then um, I, I don't know if it's Jones again, but there is three. It's between minute 66 and minute 71. There is three Middlesbrough counters that are very dangerous. And just like I said earlier about the streak scoring, if you can't cut the counters out, and if every time you throw your bodies forward, that um, Middlesbrough get their chance like a basketball game to go up the other end, this is going to be tough for you, man. Yeah. In the second leg. This is, this is going to be hard. Because Colwell can't mark Jones. I, I no. think that's pretty clear, to be honest with you. I mean, pretend yeah. otherwise if you want, but no, I think that's pretty clear. I uh, saw the same thing that they they made it a, a tactical plan to target Colwell. Yeah, from the first minute. Now, if you look here, you start to see some better from Chelsea. So, and this is in the second. Now we're moving on to kind yeah. of the second half second, here. Of second what's going half. On. Now, if I'm the Chelsea coach at halftime, my concern is three v three centre mid. We're doing nothing, so you have to produce a man up, right? But yep. when we put our centre forward back. That did nothing either. And the bad thing about bringing the forward back is I know everyone loves when Kane does it, but if you're replacing him with Enzo Fernandez, that's come not, on, man. That's so not Enzo's game. That. That's so, not Enzo's game at all to be yeah. playing that far forward. And that's something that Chelsea fans have been critical of Pochettino so far is that he's not really finding ways to maximize Enzo Fernandez so far. Yeah. So the other way is to you could have an inverted fullback like City. You yep. could have an inverted winger as a second 10. You could have a full uh, centre back come forward with the ball. Again, City's so good at Harry Maguire is good at that. I know he likes to be a laughing stock, but he's good at that. And if the centre backs start to come forward, that's four v three. If a winger checks in, it's five v three. It's interesting now. Like we showed you two v five earlier, but Middlesbrough kind of know this, and that's why these front two are not pressing too aggressively. They're dropping off and they're kind of cutting that stream off into the middle. They want everything wide, which again. You're not that frightened of Raheem Sterling if you're begging people to go wide. This, again, Palmer's come, he's got the ball, he's being crowded out. Two problems with this. Even with your forward in, 
you're still deeply outnumbered. Yep. Six v two. Six. Yeah. And then here, two centre backs, Enzo Fernandez. So even if Palmer does pull that off, like sign me up for ninety minutes of that in the second leg. And there's, then there's look nowhere at the to go ball. with it. Look at the vulnerability to the counter. Yeah, because you, you got one, two, three, four, five, six. You only have four guys, four guys and a goalkeeper. And now you add on, you got Jones coming again. And now Lath might be back for the second leg, who is just as fast. This is a problem for Chelsea. This isn't Middlesbrough come down and lay on their well, back for the second leg. This is a problem. And if you get if you get a speedster, you know, get your speedster back up front. And we start Thiago Silva. I can guarantee you where that uh, where they're going to be trying to use that speedster because they've been doing it to Thiago Silva a lot this season. Where I mean, and credit, he's our he's one of our better center backs. And but I think that a lot of things that, that are wrong with you know, he's just old at this point. You know, he doesn't have the recovery pace he used to have at you know twenty five. And that's just that's just human aging, right? That's just how it works. Yeah. Um, but well, you're, I mean, you're right. This is this is. I mean, look at this right here. What is going on in the midfield? Well, I actually, Trav, finally they figured something out here. So. Be patient with me here. Okay. Minutes, I'm just I'm so used to just looking at numbers. Seventy yeah. third right? <laughs> minute here, we finally figured it out. Where's Caicedo now? The ball's gone from here to here. Caicedo gets the ball now, and Middlesbrough's front four is cut out. Honestly, brother, it might be the first time. Seventy third minute. Now Housen's trapped. Housen goes to press Caicedo. Look at Gallagher pulling off. Yep. This is dangerous yep. now. Again, finally. So if Chelsea can a... do this. Yeah, yeah, they could win three, four goals. But it took 73 yeah. minutes to adjust. Yeah, I don't expect it, to be honest with you, based on what I saw the Villa. You know, like, I, I, I don't know if I see Middlesbrough winning, but I see this being very nervy for Chelsea because at some point, Jones and Cole will have 1v1, and I don't know that Chelsea hold up. This, again, better, right? So we're numbered down, but the difference now, that's a right back. That's Sterling, and off here is Broha, who we subbed on, I think, as a forward. So yes. now we've got both centre-backs covered by the winger and the forward. We've got much more numbers high in dangerous areas. I think Mudrick's on at this point. So yeah, Sterling, Mudrick was on. Yeah, so Sterling goes to right winger slash centre-forward, kind of a hybrid because we're pushing now, and the outlet on that side was the fullback. Should have been the full game, really. But, again, I have a real problem with sat in. This was a Chelsea... Attack, turn the ball over. One, two, three, four, five Middlesbrough players who don't have the fear to back off and like their odds of winning it high. Middlesbrough's deepest yep. sentiment is Johnny Housen, and you'll see in a second where he is. Yeah, and that's a great point because this is the 86th minute right now, and, I mean, Burroughs pushing yeah. over half of their team forward. Right now. There's a defensive sentiment. What did I say about the streak scoring, about the pressure? Yeah, yeah the, you can't get out. Like this, arguably, is not a good idea. You should back off. What are they going to do from there? But Middlesbrough, are like, nah, they're not getting out of there. You know, this no. is this is trained disrespect. You've not made them fear you. You've not made them back off. You've not made them frightened. So now you're going to deal with the consequences of them up in your face. Um, so I think this was a much better performance than people give it credit for from Middlesbrough. Chelsea had more of the ball. That's fine. They know they they have a better team, but this is. This was a very aggressive, very trained, very energetic Middlesbrough team that were well aware of both what was their job and what was someone else's job. They're not running round out of position. The passing lanes aren't there. Chelsea are forced wide time and time and time again. And in the first half, it was Sterling getting shut down. And again, that's a fullback now. Now we've got Palmer. We've got Sterling up here. Now we've got some numbers. But it's a fantastic defensive performance and if people's response to that is, well, they should play the right way, they should do this, they should do that, why? They won the match. Yeah, when did this weird mindset of you should play in a way that your opponent enjoys? It's literally the antithesis of competitive sports. Yeah. No, it is. And I think there is there is a lot of that in the in the game today. This, you know, and I see this a lot too, where people get mad at, you know what they feel is not, you know, attractive football to watch as a fan. And, you know, it doesn't have enough of this, doesn't have enough, you know, basically quick one twos through the buildup and things like that. But you're right. At the end of the day, you can do those kinds of nice, beautiful football all day, but if it doesn't get the result, then you didn't meet the only objective of the game, which yeah. is score one more than the opponent. That's it. That's the only objective. And there's a thousand ways to accomplish that. And 
no one's going to remember no one's going to remember what somebody did and how good it looked if they lost they're going to remember what happened in the results that's what it is and i i think i've definitely come to around on that side this season where the the results aren't there in this match too the result isn't there and i think that you know what we see from this burrow match in that second half offensively i think he highlighted it right there cuz i watched them i watched the whole second half got to just see it just felt like the whole time i watched it i felt Okay, 10 more minutes, and I don't see any more suggestion we're going to score. 10 more yeah. minutes, and I don't see any suggestion we're going to score. We maybe started getting a little bit more. I know Mudrick had a had one cross that went to Alfie Gilchrist there, uh, and, and Gilchrist headed it and went out for a quarter. That was a pretty good chance. But other than that, I mean, I mean, the goalkeeper Glover had a couple spills. But, again, no one was attacking or following I mean, the there, shot. There, there was chances. I mean, Cole Palmer could have had a hat trick, but – what I, would but he missed him. That, what I would say to that is, like, the first one, Johnny Halson rolls it to him. Yes. The, it was the, just second a, just one, a... the second one, the keeper drops at his feet. So, yes, he could have, should have, would have scored. But, like, that's not build. It's not no. dominance. Especially no. when Middlesbrough's up the other end a minute later. Um, yep. So, like, it's this second half interest, it's second leg interest me. I think it's well worth looking closely at the Chelsea centre-backs on the ball. Because if they just do the same thing again and there is no moving up the field to provide a man up in centre mid and it's rolling it round in a U-shape again, I, as a Middlesbrough fan, I'm going to start to enjoy that. If yeah. centre forward comes in again and doesn't do nothing again and we have Conor Gallagher and Enzo Fernandez as your high focal point in the attack, sign me up. Now, Sterling might have had a nightmare. If he plays better, could he win the game on his own? Yes, he could. Boy on the other wing, haven't seen as much of him. Does he look like he could light it up and win a game? Yes, he could. But if if we get the same performance, I think ultimately Middlesbrough scoring a counter and Chelsea have a breakdown. Yep. To be honest with you. No, no, I, I think, you know, kind of previewing the second leg, I, I I'm I am concerned. I think that there is I do have some anticipation that we'll go back and we'll, you know, we'll get that first half goal in the second leg. And then I think things will open up a lot from there, how we respond. Yeah. If Chelsea score and go up on the scoreboard at like aggregate, Middlesbrough do not come back. I really think that. But will Chelsea and score? That's the thing. Will we score? Because based on what we saw in this match, and we have a lot of, you know, we're missing uh, uh, Nicholas Jackson for AFCON. I mean, he's been our, basically our only guy that started up front the entire season, more or less. He's gotten most of the minutes there. That's a big loss for us up front. You know, Broya can't really cope. We're having to play, you know, kind of Palmer in this forward false nine type role, which is not where we play. We haven't used that kind of role within the 11 the entire season up until now. So I, I think that I do have some cautious, optimistic, you know, approach to this that Chelsea can get a goal and, and win this. But here's what I will say. If Chelsea do not score in the first half of the second leg, yes. I don't I don't think they're going to win. I, don't, I, I just realistically do not think they'll win this match. It's going to get very tense. And then I think big picture, it's going to get very dark for Pochettino. It, and rightfully so. I mean, it, you know, there's been too much money spent. There's not right now Champions League football on the table. There's not even Europa. There's not even Conference League. We're not going to be – if we lose to – and I said this quietly in some in some some chats that I'm in. I just kind of said, look, if we lose a two-legged semifinal to Burrow, some very tough conversations need to be had well, internally. I agree, because if you're saying, like, this team's not ready to win the league, fair, okay. I mean, Villa are banging the mix. Well, well, okay, I'll let you have that. Um, yep. We can't make the top four. We can't make Europa. We can't beat Middlesbrough. Like, where's the flaw? Where's it just, where's just the... endless pushing off of responsibility into the future? Yes, I've exactly. worried about this since Lampard and Potter with Chelsea. Yep. It, and you can't you can't just keep kicking the, the can down the road and hoping eventually it, it turns into something great because it won't. If you don't set the standard now, when does it ever get set? Yeah, that's and I think that's where we're at. Um, I think that it's going to be a great second leg. And you know what? I, I, I think we got to give a lot more credit to Carrick uh, for his performance there in that first leg. I, I think a lot of people have mischaracterized it. And I kind of saw a lot of the things you saw in the first half that it wasn't just parking the bus blah, 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 sitting deep, not trying, reductive, all of these, you know, kind of terms that we see thrown around online, which, you know, that's maybe not the best barometer for yeah. analysis. But, uh, <laughs> well, I, but I, uh, I, think, I think you look at the manager like a poker player. Is he getting the best out of the hand he's dealt? Pochettino, no, no shot. Not impossible to say yes is the answer to that question. I think looked at through that lens, which is how it should be looked at. 
Carrick's doing one of the best jobs in English football over the last two years. Done a great job. He has. He has, no doubt. I mean, and I know a lot of people want to act like he's not doing, you know, a whole lot, this, that, and the other. I've seen some Chelsea fans have this suggestion that as a manager, he's not very good. And I have no idea where this came from. I, I haven't heard any of that until they beat us yesterday. So, uh, yeah. Um, no, it is what it is. But hey, I know you got to hop off here. Um, so, Stu, I want to, you know, big things. Hey, thanks for coming on. Uh, it would be good if we can get a second leg, too. So this is the kind of this is the kind of discussion and analysis I enjoy a lot more than you know the stuff we typically see on on Twitter. I'll, just... I'll even show up if we get beat four 0 You have my word. Oh yeah, win or lose, I'm <laughs> I'm always here to talk about it. <laughs> All right, see you, mate. Hey, thanks so much for coming on. Appreciate it.